The brewing tension between the U.S. and China has taken a sharp turn with the unveiling of one of the world's most dangerous weapons, reportedly developed by China. In battle for technological dominance, China's bold move has sent shockwaves across the globe with its new hypersonic FOBs, leaving the United States on high alert. But what are the capabilities of this powerful weapon? How will it affect the already delicate relationship between these two powerful countries? Join us as we explore the deadly features of China's extremely dangerous UFO that has taken the U.S. by surprise. The growing competition between the United States and China has become a new kind of rivalry, focused on technology rather than traditional power. This technological cold war is changing global relationships and challenging how countries have worked together in the past. As the situation becomes more complicated, it's important to understand the different aspects of this conflict. What started as a race for economic and technological leadership has now turned into a strategic competition. The U.S., once seen as the leader in technology, is now facing a strong challenge from China, which has quickly risen to compete. Recently, China unveiled a new weapon that the United States did not see coming, the hypersonic FOBs. China's hypersonic FOBs is an advanced version of intercontinental ballistic missiles, also known as ICBMs, with a significant plus of higher range, greater speeds, and real anxiety within the United States. Once launched, a FOBs would jet into low Earth orbit, circling the Earth for as long as it needed to, with its target destination in sight. It deorbits at a speed up to 27 times the speed of sound, roughly nine times faster than any jet in operation today. The FOBs is like a space shuttle, but instead of carrying astronauts, it carries a nuclear warhead. It can strike anywhere in the world, including the U.S., and reaches its target at least 10 minutes faster than an intercontinental ballistic missile. Because of this, the U.S. would have only a few minutes to respond once they spot the missile. Even if the U.S. had plenty of time to prepare its defenses, reports suggest that the FOBs can avoid their missile defense systems due to its glider and speed. It moves too quickly for these systems to detect, stop, or destroy. In July and August of 2021, China tested its new FOBs missile system. The test involved launching a rocket into space, which then released a glide vehicle moving at very high speeds. It's reported that the warhead missed its target by about 24 miles. The FOBs technology, which was first developed during the Cold War, is less common today as most advanced militaries prefer ICBMs. ICBMs can carry larger warheads and don't need retro rockets to exit orbit like FOBs does. The exact number of warheads a FOBs can deliver is not known, and it's unclear why China is developing this system instead of improving its ICBMs. However, these tests have sparked global debates about security and arms control. FOBs missiles are not new. The Soviet Union was the first to test them in the 1960s, but they abandoned the idea because the missiles had smaller payloads and were easier to detect. Now, China has revived these missiles and made them better with new hypersonic glide vehicle technology. This HGVs have the ability to reach speeds of Mach 5 and maneuver more easily than traditional ballistic missiles, making them harder to predict and intercept. Despite these tests, the technological balance between China and the U.S. remains similar. China has about 450 ICBMs compared to the U.S.'s, but only 142 of China's ICBMs are operational. Even with new technology, it's unlikely China has a significant advantage. The U.S. is improving its radar systems, which could reduce the effectiveness of hypersonic glide vehicles. It is also believed that the tests might be causing more problems for China than benefits. They fuel American distrust and fear, possibly leading to stronger international opposition against China's military buildup. China, however, claimed that the test was a routine spacecraft experiment, not related to FOB's development. However, if China's FOBs were detected, it could severely reduce their ability to retaliate against the United States cities, which would be a serious setback for China. Their actions suggest a determination to expand its nuclear capabilities, even though it claims to have a no-first-strike policy. They are expected to have around 1,000 nuclear weapons by 2030, putting them third behind Russia and the U.S., the reasons for this increase are unclear, but it shows that China's leaders are concerned about their security. China's focus on EFOBs also lays emphasis on the gaps in current arms control agreements. While the Outer Space Treaty bans nuclear weapons in space, it does not cover conventional weapons. This creates potential loopholes that could be exploited. 
FOBs could potentially be used to distract U.S. defenses, making it easier for other attacks. Even though China may not yet have the capability to match the United States in nuclear retaliation, any loss of U.S. cities would be catastrophic. As mentioned earlier, China was not the first to create a weapon like this. In the early 1960s, Soviet officials began considering the development of a FOBs-like weapon, especially after the success of the Sputnik launch. The Soviet Union thought it was a logical step since they believed that the U.S. was planning to use space for nuclear attacks. The success of the Soviet Vostok program, which put a human into orbit, made this idea seem more possible. The Soviet Union saw several key benefits in developing the FOBs. It allowed for an unlimited striking range with nuclear weapons and could launch an attack from any direction, whether from the North or South Pole, or even both simultaneously. The system was designed to avoid early warning radar by traveling on a low Earth orbit path, which was not covered by U.S. radar systems that focused on higher altitude missiles. Soviet rocket engineer Sergei Korolev was one of the first to design a FOBs-like missile. His design, known as the GR-1 or SSX-10 Scrag, began development in 1960 and was officially approved in September 1962. Korolev pitched this idea to Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, who then announced that the Soviet Union could use global missiles to bypass early warning radar systems and reach targets quickly. The GR-1 was designed to be detected by NATO radar only two minutes before impact. The GR-1 had three stages, weighed 117 tons, and was 35.31 meters long. It carried a 2.2 megaton nuclear warhead and used a mix of kerosene and liquid oxygen as fuel. At the same time, two other FOBs-type missile projects were being developed. One was by Soviet missile engineer Vladimir Chelemy, who proposed the UR-200A and GR-2. The UR-200A, derived from his UR-200 ICBM, was chosen for further development. It used different engines and stable liquid propellants, such as nitrogen tetroxide and UDMH. The other project was by Soviet designer Mikhail Yangel, who proposed the R-36. Approved in April 1962, this missile used an ICBM design as a base. It had three stages with an aiming system for correcting its trajectory and a retro rocket for deorbiting. The warhead was housed in the OG seat module, which also controlled maneuvering and separation of the warhead from the missile. The R-36 O was 32.60 meters long, three meters in diameter, and had a total launch mass of 180 tons. It used hypergolic propellants similar to those in the UR-200. The warhead's explosive yield was between 5 and 20 megatons, according to Soviet sources, though Western intelligence suggests it was smaller, between 1 and 3.5 megatons. In 1965, Soviet officials had to pick one of the three FOBs projects to continue with. They chose Yangel's R-36 O design over the others. It's not entirely clear why this choice was made, especially since none of the missiles had been tested yet. However, there were issues with the other designs that likely influenced the decision. Korolev's GR-1 was a problem because it used a type of fuel that wasn't practical for long-term storage in missile silos. The GR-1's rocket also had a history of failure in tests, and it was similar in design to another problematic missile project. Because of these issues, the military decided to look for a better option. The GR-1 also faced criticism from Soviet analysts for its ability to handle U.S. missile defense systems and its lengthy fueling process. Delays in producing the GR-1's engine contributed to its downfall, and the project was abandoned in January 1965. Chelemy's UR-200A lost support after Khrushchev, who had been a key supporter, was removed from power in 1964. The new military leaders preferred Yangel's R-36 O, leading to the end of the UR-200A project in 1965. The Soviet Union tested and used the R-36 O missile at a site near Baikonur, Kazakhstan. They built a testing station and a facility to assemble the missile. In 1965, they adapted two test pads for the R-36 O's early flights and constructed 18 launch silos between the mid-1960s and 1971. These silos were spaced 10 to 15 kilometers apart to avoid multiple silos being destroyed by a single attack. Originally, the Soviets planned 19 launches, but ended up doing 24 by 1971. The first four launches were from a ground pad, with the missile flying to the Kamchatka Peninsula. Later tests involved launching from a silo into orbit, 
then directing the missile's payload back to Soviet territory over the Pacific Ocean. Over 2,000 Soviet personnel were involved, with six tests failing completely and the others having varying levels of success. Before the first launches, the Soviets claimed that they were testing a space vehicle landing system over the Pacific. The first test flight was on December 16, 1965, but it missed the target due to a malfunction. The second test on February 5, 1966, failed because of a retro rocket issue. The third test on March 16, 1966, failed due to a fueling problem. The fourth test on May 20, 1966, had some success, but the payload didn't separate as planned. Subsequent tests from silos faced issues, including intentional destruction of the missile due to an engine malfunction. One failed test caused debris to fall over the Midwestern United States. In 1967, the Soviets conducted 10 more tests, with nine showing some success. They used public statements about satellite launches to cover their R-36O tests. On November 19, 1968, the R-36O was declared operational and deployed in groups of six. By 1971, all 18 silos in Kazakhstan were in use. NATO intelligence believed the R-36O targeted the U.S. Grand Forks Air Force Base, where an ABM system was planned. The missile was not equipped with a nuclear payload until 1972. In the 1960s, the Outer Space Treaty prevented both the U.S. and the Soviet Union from placing nuclear weapons in orbit. But that wasn't the only reason the Soviet FOB stayed grounded. The U.S. had stopped focusing on defenses against nuclear weapons, making the FOBs less relevant since Soviet ICBMs could still cause significant damage. Now, with the Outer Space Treaty in the past, there's nothing stopping major nations from putting nuclear weapons in orbit, as China has shown. According to the Financial Times, China tested its hypersonic orbital bombardment weapon in August. China says it was just testing a space plane, but given their recent push in weapon development, their explanation seems unlikely. The big question is, why has China developed this powerful weapon so quickly, faster than the United States could keep up with? The reason is similar to why Moscow developed such weapons over 50 years ago, to overcome the U.S. missile defenses. It makes sense because a FOBs is one of the few weapons the U.S. doesn't have a complete defense against. The FOBs could keep the target location hidden until the last moment, only revealing it when the payload was released. This ability gives it an edge against defense systems. It also has the advantage of reaching its target about minutes faster than an ICBM. The Soviets believed the FOBs could defeat U.S. anti-ballistic missile systems, either by neutralizing defenses against ICBMs or by serving as a powerful standalone weapon. U.S. officials later suggested they could develop countermeasures, indicating that the FOBs was indeed effective against the defenses of its time. But maybe not for long, because if anything, the United States is notorious for having the best response to threats. How will the U.S. respond? The U.S. must find a way to make China believe in nuclear deterrence and put their fobs away. Trying to ask really nicely would only risk giving them something to laugh about. The U.S. must prove they can handle Chinese fobs or deal similar damage to China with some sci-fi weapons of their own. Marco Longbrook, an expert on space, suggests that the U.S. should extend its ballistic missile defenses and add anti-satellite missiles. Some think this might not be the best idea, as building a defense shield could lower the morale of everyday Americans who feel vulnerable. There are already comparisons being made to the Sputnik crisis from the 1950s, when Americans feared the Soviets launching the first artificial satellite, the Sputnik 1. The U.S. has two main options, either get neighboring countries to build their own missile defense systems or create more defenses within the U.S. The first option sounds logical, but is expensive and involves spending money on defense systems outside U.S. borders. For instance, the ground-based mid-course defense system in Alaska cost about $70 billion, and a proposed site in New York was estimated to cost $3.6 billion for just five years and could only handle five enemy missiles. China is making space defenses more complicated by testing both orbit-based and non-orbit-based attacks. The Space Force is determined to keep up with China, spending a lot to do so. China has also tested a satellite that can disable U.S. satellites, which the Space Force finds troubling. In 2013, China launched a satellite called Xi'an, which had large grappling arms to capture other satellites. 
China said it was for research, but it's unusual to research weapons before developing them. Russia has also been active. They launched three attack-capable satellites. The first, called Kamikaze, was launched in 2014 and could move at high speeds. A later satellite, launched in 2017, could shoot projectiles. The third satellite, the Nesting Doll, combined these abilities, making it like a fighter jet in space. All this space weaponry has caught the attention of the U.S. The U.S. Space Force was established the same year Russia launched its fighter satellite. The Space Force and other parts of the U.S. military, including Air Force and companies like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and Northrop Grumman, are working on advanced technologies like powerful lasers to destroy satellites and missiles. The U.S. Navy and Army recently tested a hypersonic missile at the Pacific Missile Range in Hawaii. This test helped gather important data about how the missile works from start to finish for both a conventional prompt strike and long-range hypersonic weapon programs. During the test, the missile launched, creating a large fireball and clouds of smoke. Vice Admiral Johnny R. Wolfe Jr., who is in charge of the Navy's strategic systems programs, called the test an important step in developing hypersonic missiles for the nation. Lieutenant General Robert Rash Jr. from the Army also added that with this new technology, the military will stay ahead of any potential threats. Aside from this new technology that was recently tested, Lockheed Martin and Co. Aspire have also introduced the new Mako multi-mission hypersonic missile at the Sea Airspace 2024 event. Rick Loy, a senior program manager at Lockheed Martin, explained that the missile is designed for the U.S. Navy. It's a fast, affordable, and highly capable system that can target multiple threats with one weapon. The Mako, named after the fastest shark, was showcased for the first time since development began seven years ago. A display at the event showed an F-35A launching six Mako missiles quickly from internal and external mounts. Although Mako is versatile, it wasn't created for the Navy's hypersonic air-launched offensive anti-surface program. Instead, it was initially Lockheed Martin's bid for the U.S. Air Force's stand and attack weapon program, designed to hit enemy missiles and air defense systems. Northrop Grumman ultimately won the SIAW contract, but Mako remains an advanced option for future missions. Even though the Mako missile was revealed, Rick Loy from Lockheed Martin couldn't share many details with Naval News. He could only reveal that the missile uses multiple guidance methods and has electronic packages, but didn't give more specifics. However, he did confirm that Mako can reach at least Mach 5. The model shown at the event was the same one used for fitting tests on different aircraft. According to Loy, Mako has been checked for compatibility with several fighter jets in maritime patrol aircraft, and it can fit onto any aircraft with 30-inch lugs, like those using the BRU-32 ejector rack. This hypersonic missile was tested on advanced planes like the F-35, F-22, F-16s, F-15, F-18, and the Navy's P-8. Loy also said it can be loaded inside an F-35 with one missile fitting in each bay. The missile can also be launched from aircraft on carriers, and there's potential for it to be launched from ships, ground platforms, or even submarines. So China's FOBs might not be so invincible after all, because apart from the United States' investment into the creation of hypersonic missiles, this country has also made a statement of its own in other departments, seeing as they have the most powerful air force in the world and the largest aircraft carriers in history. Thanks for watching. While you are still here, click on the link on your screen to check out another of our videos. See you there.